Yeah, I'm back guys. It's been a while and here we are again for a little podcast today. So without my face and uh, without too many video files or whatever. Today we're going to talk about something more private. Today we're going to talk about that we actually bought an electric vehicle. Yes, um, that's true. So after a long, long, long time of... Uh, thinking about getting an electric vehicle, um, the situation came a lot quicker than we thought. But today we are going to talk about more the why we chose to go for an electric vehicle than the when and what. It's really about the why and I'm trying to really go into the detail of why we think it's a good decision for us, but why I also think personally that it is a good moment for a lot of people to change to an electric vehicle. And I'm also trying to, you know, clear some of the myth that are still going on outside um, and uh, false false information about electric vehicles in general. And I want to clarify some of these things. And now we're going to talk about this. But uh, yeah, sit back, relax. And first of all, we're going to start with what kind of car we have and how it came. Now, it really is a, a great thing to say this finally, but uh, we got a Hyundai Ioniq 5 and this is a brand new SUV type uh, car from Hyundai and um, it's just been released in 2021. And we were actually very lucky to get one um, that was available right at the time where we needed it, which is not a given because they have quite a long uh, delivery time at the moment as potentially most of the vehicles out there and most of all electronic. And a car nowadays, an electric vehicle is more electronic than anything else. Now, we um, got into the situation that obviously since I became dad uh, half a year ago, and this is also a new situation because um, you guys don't know it. You guys haven't heard that, at least not on this channel. And uh, this changed obviously the situation in our lives and we needed to come up with creative solutions to get all the stuff from A to B. And in my old car, which was a BMW 1 series car, um, the, the space was limited. Let's put it that way. My wife actually, she had a VW Polo, um, which is even smaller than the One Series. And we got these cars for a lot of years. My wife had her car for like six and a half or seven years even, and I had mine for almost nine years. Um, and both cars were a lot older than this because we purchased them already um, at a used stage. Now, at this point in time, we were trying to somehow get get away with it. You know, we didn't want to buy a new car. We were like, yeah, let's, let's hang in there a little bit. Let's drive. Um, as long as possible with these cars until they give up on us um, naturally <laughs> simply because we were like you know what um, we don't really want to spend the money at this point we don't see the necessity and um, yeah but faith sometimes happens um, and so one morning when I was taking my, my wife's car to work um, it just broke down on me. Uh, just suddenly the, mo the, the engine just died uh, out of nowhere and I potentially thought at the first glance that's not something, you know, too bad um, because this car never actually had a failure. Um, my wife is like a very organized person and she treats things very well and she's a beautiful and um, lovely human being but she's also a pretty, pretty damn brilliant driver um, and I love to say that because I find it very good when, when people in general can drive, you know. I don't want to say woman or man or whatever, I just say people in general, when they can drive a car, I find that very sympathetic, you know, I like that. Um, because I would say about myself that I do drive quite well as well. Anyways, that's just a side note. Um, but since I know that, and she's a very capable driver, and I know that her car was always treated well, I wasn't too worried at this point. But um, yeah, two days later, my mood changed. <laughs> Our mood changed. Because we got the diagnosis uh, that this car is basically done. Uh, the engine had a, a big issue. I, you know, I, I couldn't even give it to you in German or break it to you in German what that exactly was. So I'm not even trying in English. But basically what I can say you, to you is that the value of the, uh, or like, or let's say, the, the money we would have invested into the car to fix it again was far higher than the value of the car still was. So it's basically... Um, a total failure at this point and we needed to get rid of it um, and we did get rid of it quite nicely um, over, over just basically via online uh, uh, auction so that was really easy um, and we got still some decent money on it and then you know the big the big search for a car happened and we were a little bit worried what we wanted to get and we were actually looking for a used car 
um, of the size of a small SUV. You know, we were looking at the likes of like an like an Audi Q3 or like a, a BMW X1 or X3, maybe an older one, or like a VW Tiguan, and like these kind of cars, you know, um, that go in this range. But once we started to, well, <laughs> look into the market for used cars in Germany, um, we were quite surprised by how expensive they are at this point, even though that everyone is going into, you know, sustainability and giving money for purchasing electric vehicles and so on. We never had it on the radar. But so that was our situation. We needed a new car. We have a baby. We wanted a future proof car and uh, we wanted a car that offers enough space to carry stuff from a baby around and um, also give us the freedom of still doing a lot of things in the city. And you must know that for us, we we are really the kind of people that use the car like almost 50-50. Like 50% is like really urban, really city, just going to the doctor with the baby, just going to my football training in the evening, just going to the supermarket and back, just driving to, to, to work and back. It's all like in the range of 30 to 40 kilometers a day maximum. But then we also have our family, which is living in quite a bit of way from us like it's um, 50 kilometers away so going there and back is like always 100 kilometers of uh um, range we have to cover and we obviously wanted to have something that covers this range easily and we don't have to you know fuel again every couple of days and i have to say that my old bmw was really getting in trouble when it comes to consumption i was way above nine liters on 100 kilometers which is ridiculous um and you know with the prices uh, for fuel uh, it's it's just yeah it's really expensive and this is also why these things together combined offered a little bit uh the, the ground that an electric vehicle was becoming a little bit more relevant to us and um, yeah this is the point when we switch over from the story behind to the why now we really wanted for a while now to become a lot more sustainability uh, sustainable in our life we, we tried a lot of things and we are not there yet by far we are still doing a lot of things wrong but we are really looking into getting getting things done better um, we just try to get away with all the plastic um, stuff we have here for like drinks and stuff so we, we switch completely to glass uh, when it comes to uh, water and stuff so you, we always do our water here um, with the water available and uh, put it in some glass bottles and reuse them all the time so you don't have the plastic all, all the time um, and just also change a couple of things like we um, try to get rid of all the um, bags that you would carry to the supermarket and all these plastic bags we literally we don't have any bags anymore we just have a couple of these uh, reusable bags uh, from some supermarkets that offer them for a couple of years now and we really also now switch to some little bags for like uh, you know vegetables and stuff like that so you do, that you also don't get these uh, hygienic plastic thingies which are called hygienic but they're like super unhygienic if you want but whatever um, this is this is kind of what we want to do as well and so an electric vehicle was at least for me a little bit of a dream um, but with the prices at the at the moment a, a far away dream <laughs> a dream that really wasn't in range um, so money wise you know we had a certain budget to spend that we would have also spent on a um, used car but since I am always like as emotional as I am sometimes um, I am really when it comes to these things I'm very pragmatic I sit down and I do a full calculation and I do the full calculation um, with the next five to eight years in mind only on a financial basis you never you, you should never plan that far ahead in, t in general because too many things ha happen but just on a financial basis and I put things on the table to compare them to each other and here's where the why really comes into play we then figured that getting a used car in the range of 20,000 euros is something um, affordable for us. However, if you then calculate in, you have to always look into that, you know, you have to look into, is this really feasible for us? So check mark, yes it is. But 
The next question is, is it future-proof? Well, kind of check mark. If you get a good brand, maybe secondhand and then um, still get a little bit of a guarantee to it, yes somehow but not fully because you get a used car and you can never 100% trust that this car was treated the way that the one selling it is telling you um, and if you do it for private which most likely has a better value um, you, you still can't guarantee it you know people might hide something from you or even if you go for a reseller sometimes they even don't know what happened with the car and they do it with a good mind obviously but if they haven't double checked it fully then sometimes things slip through and I have actually experienced quite a lot of these things not directly but with some friends um, that had these things and so you always have to count in that that little risk of something happening there's also a second factor that is called risk and this is the, the car can still break, break down even though the people that you bought it from never have hidden anything or didn't lie to you still you know things can happen and if you get a used car that has like 100,000 kilom uh, kilometers already done there is always a chance that some parts just get up, give up on you all of a sudden um, which you know you shouldn't you shouldn't expect with modern day cars but we thought the same with the vw polo because it was a, a polo from 2011 i guess no it actually was from 2011 so you wouldn't think it's an old car by any means but yeah 132 thousand kilometers was uh, actually the value on the speedometer um, at the end um, where it broke down so you are never free from it you know I still do hope that our BMW does a lot longer than this because we still have it as a backup second car um, and we put these factors on the table and then the big one is the is the fuel consumption one and the fuel consumption you always have to calculate in so how much do you have to pay in comparison to what you would have to pay for like well loading your electric vehicle and um, this is where it starts to pick to become a little bit more interesting surely our car now costs almost double as the budget we have set to ourselves however um, if you put this well double the amount put this on the table for five to eight years and then you go and divide this by the amount of month that you have and you factor in how much you would save by loading the car effectively eight to four times depending on where you load and if you can always load at home so you, it's unfair to say eight times because that's only when you have your very much cheapest uh you know uh, cheapest contract at home with the with the energy you have at home we do have a wall box so that makes sense um but you always have to you know uh, use um, kind of you know loading stations at, at high highways which are a lot more expensive and then the factor eight is by far not fair it's almost like four to two or sometimes it can even go to one by one but that is just like um something which i think is going to be eliminated very soon um but yeah so you will save up a lot and i can already tell you now now from two months of experience with the car we save almost uh, 250 euros a month and actually the amount of money we spent into fuel before was 250 or whatever so kind of no even 300 or something so we basically save most of it because we only pay like 50 bucks or so on fuel um or like i don't you know i mean loading it electricity that's what it is i still need to get used to that so yeah, this is the first reason, is a very much, very boring, rational, calculated financial aspect. But now, next to this financial aspect, that is just having the break even after six and a half-ish years, I think I calculated. I think that was just like kind of the break even. Um, so you have to wait until you have this kind of thing. But the bigger, prop, uh, the bigger point here is the factoring uh, of risk, because risk is something as a young family you don't want to have okay uh, as you want to eliminate as many risks as you can and getting a new car for still a lot of money like 20,000 euros is still a freaking lot of money um, putting that into a car and having that risk is always available um, and is always a problem um, because yeah it, it could it could just make things a little more complicated more complicated than they need to be so uh, at the end of the day we needed to decide what to do and um, we just checked some of the you know uh, brands what they offer as electric vehicles you know and then obviously you will pretty quickly see that they give you a guarantee of eight to ten years and we now have a guarantee of ten years and for the battery eight years which 
As you can tell, since I told you that the break even is after six and a half years, you are well in there, you're safe from when it comes down to this, because even though if something breaks down before that, you still have the guarantee. And I read through the whole contract, and yes, they have their nit bits in there, but they're not as bad as with some other insurances. <clears throat> you know, um, it's still very much doable and very fair. So when you're not very stupid and you drive into someone else or into a wall, which is completely obvious that it was your uh, obvious faults, um, then they will always jump in with the guarantee. So that is that is pretty good. So it takes away that risk, you know. Um, and then obviously the second risk is that something was wrong with the car because you just purchased a new car. You always have the guarantee that you get all the parts, you know, done. We have it now for like two months. Nothing happened. So fingers crossed that it stays that way. But you know, minimizing that risk. And for those of you who are um, familiar with the car market or in general. Um, you will notice that this is still a weird calculation that I'm doing because obviously and you could say that now and you would be totally right hey man if you just you know you are able to afford double the amount that I just named so 40,000 instead of 20,000 you can also get like a very good current internal combustion engine car which is super uh, fuel efficient and just cost 30,000 in the same range because you can right um, and we looked into that yes yes you can you can you can get like a let's say Vbolt W Tiguan or like a Seat um, I think it's a Tika uh, the one I was looking into you can get them for like 30,000 in in kind of the um, features we wanted to have in the car because we also don't have the standard version but I'm coming to the actual car we have uh, a bit later now yes you are right and this would be cheaper and uh, since they're very you know fuel efficient and you th then need to calculate that against the BMW which was like consuming fuel as hell you would still get off with a lot more uh, cheaper in terms of uh, you know fuel consumption per month and you the break even in comparison to an electric vehicle would be a lot longer than six and a half years so potentially eight to nine to ten years before you have that so at the end f to be fair a good cheap internal combustion engine car a new one around 30 to 35000 would have been efficient effectively the more cheap uh, solution here and i am not here to tell you that this isn't true or whatever i don't want to want to say something that is not true in general and make things look more beautiful than they actually are however this is then the moment where i sat down and i thought about everything and you know it just what life offers to me and this might be a bit more I said this you know I most often than not I am very emotional but I, I like to be quiet at some point and just look back at what we achieved in life and we my family my my wife and so on and also what I achieved and somehow at some point I also feel a certain responsibility because I I really feel that we have to change our lives a lot to remain happy with our planet as it is and I think uh, it is it is not very bold to assume that uh, you know the climate change is not really you know far away anymore it's it's there and um, we have to act quickly and me and my wife and we have a good life we earn money we are very fortunate we are gifted we have a wonderful little baby it's healthy I, I can't even express how lucky we are and from this position, I felt the urge and also the responsibility that we can afford something like an EV. And this is where this, this moment of truth happened, where we were like, yes, this is the decision we take. We are going for an EV here. Yes, by far, it's not really good at the moment in Germany when it comes to EVs, like the infrastructure is not really there. Um, it's okay-ish, but it's it's not great. Um, and yes, it's a lot more expensive than if we would have gone for the cheap temporary solution. But it's future-proof. And it's the good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And it's definitely something that made us for the last two months very happy. But yeah, so this is the why. This is why we choose to go for an EV. And this is the time where I tell you what kind of EV we have. So, we do have the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Uh, this is a brand new SUV type of car. And it um, is the version with the bigger battery, is a real rear wheel drive uh, version. And it also is the second 
uh, best, no, it's the third best package. I think it's like they have four different packages, but um, the, the, you can just get rid of the first one because that's a standard one. And we've got the second one, if you wish, with a couple of extras of the third one. Complicated. I hate this. I just want, you know, buying a car is dramatically more stressful than I thought. Um, but whatever, we have exactly the features we wanted. There were like two or three features from the higher higher tier cars that, you know, are like packages that we would have liked to have, but none of them are really necessary. Like truth to be told, I'm not a junkie that needs a certain power or a certain technical thingy in the car. For me personally, it's very important. Is the car practical? Is it looking good? Um, is it efficient in its, in its way uh, in terms of space, but also in terms of how it drives and stuff? And does it have the necessary things? And the Hyundai Ioniq 5 really checks all these boxes beautifully. And we did like a little test drive uh, just a couple days before the car broke down, just out of curiosity. Um, just because we wanted to have a look how an EV drives and I already drove a Tesla a couple of years ago but nothing more than this and also some kind of plug-in plug -in hybrid cars but you know they are different um, so I was really curious to see and this like test drive really blew us away that was a lot of fun and a completely different feeling of driving driving car and yeah so we were really lucky enough to experience that um, and so our decision was already a little bit pre-shaped. But then as we were really going into the current situation in the EV market, in the range that we wanted, we just had a couple of options. And these options were the VW ID4, the Audi uh, Q3 e-tron or q4 e-tron i think it's the q4 e-tron which is in that range the uh, skoda um, enyaq actually the kia ev6 which is just about being released um and it's actually not even released yet but um then we have the hyundai Ioniq 5 obviously and well i think you know the model y from tesla uh, potentially would have been in there as well but with all the delivery stuff and so on at the moment it really wasn't on our radar however the reason why we chose the Yonai is mainly because of the looks. This car is few, freaking beautiful. They all range somewhat in the same price level, plus minus. It's totally okay, but if you if you get the Skoda Enyaq, which is a tiny bit more cheap, um, if you want to have that in the same kind of uh, you know uh, features that we have in the car, you nearly pay the same. Um, and so we have a very very solid version of this car. It has a lot of power, way more than we even needed. It's beautiful, it's um, very practical, the space usage of this car, even though people say something else about this car, it ha doesn't have the net space as other cars would have, but the layout in the car and how you can move things around, how you can reposition the seats and move the seats makes it a very versatile car in terms of usage and we really have no issue with the space at all. It is really beautiful. Um, I will actually show this in a vlog about our journey to Spain, which I will talk about at the end of today's little podcast. Now, yeah, that said, um, you know the car and I have, at this point, you will have seen the car many, many times because I will loop the footage in the background simply because I don't have anything else or maybe I put a photo in. Um, this is all good and nice, but now we have to take a couple of minutes at the end to talk about some of the wrong perceptions that I firsthand have experienced already on the parking lot loading my my vehicle <laughs> um, on the road and elsewhere especially online i don't know where and why this really comes from but i wouldn't call myself an enthusiast enthusiast for electric vehicles or vehicles in general i mean i loved my car and i loved quick cars i loved formula one i mean obviously as a german with michael schumacher in the 90s and so on you can expect that we grew up with like fuel in our veins you know however the, the times just changed and i'm hopefully i can say that i'm uh, aware enough to to see that and to feel this and i have to say of course if you listen to a freaking maserati ferrari engine you know roaring next to you that is something else yes i also get goosebumps from that i you know i wouldn't i wouldn't sit here and to, to try to tell you the truth if I wasn't able to tell you the truth about this. And 
I must lie or I would have to lie if I would say it doesn't bother me. No, that's that's not a thing. However, if you if you are aware enough and if you can grow um, or in, you can let grow that an EV is just a different kind of fun. This is different, of course it is, but it gives you a lot more than a Maserati can't offer you. Um, and that is great. However, there are still a couple of things that people assume that are simply wrong. So the first thing is that people still just shout everywhere that an EV is still more um, like more heavy on the environment, especially with uh, the you know CO2, than a normal internal combustion engine, and that is just completely <clears throat> you know bullshit. The, the thing why people still believe that, and it's, it's widely uh, spread, is because of a lot of um, <laughs> oil companies and and car companies have paid a lot of money for some rather scientific I, I don't even know no it's not scientific um, some weirdly proven um, essays about how and um, this is happening and they always calculate the amount of uh, fuel or like you know exhausts used to create energy for the cars that they do consume plus the energy which equals the tons of uh, emissions that you have um, while the production of an EV. And yes, in the very beginning, let's say 10 to 15 years ago, this means that basically when you got an EV, it had a little backpack, a backpack of a lot of emissions that it already, you know, um, consumed, so to say, before you can drive the clean car. Because however you want to put that, while you drive an EV, you do not produce any emission directly from this car that is just not possible and people just try to get in there with like telling yeah but the energy you took that did create some emissions previously when the energy was created which partly is still true but not in the bigger picture and if you then look in the bigger picture you will definitely see that um, nowadays the break even on when an ev is clean, so to say, is a lot earlier than it used to be 10 years ago. In fact, the new ICCT essay that was just released a couple of weeks ago even shows that how much better EVs got and that there is no comparison anymore to a normal internal combustion engine car, simply because the production of EVs has also been ramped up a lot. You know, it got a lot cleaner, it got a lot more um, perfectionized, it got a lot more, uh, you know, streamlined. There was a lot less emissions created during the process. There's a lot less of, um, you know, for example, cobalt and you know all these materials in the batteries, which are not great at all. I do agree with that, but you always have to put that into perspective. What is the alternative? Producing more internal combustion engine cars is not an alternative. And also e-fuels are not an alternative because e-fuels are so hard and so expensive to produce before you have enough e-fuel to fuel all the internal combustion engine cars, people would still drive another 20 years on, on gas, you know? And that's not the target. The target has to be to reduce the amount of gas-driven cars as quickly and as efficiently as possible because the fact is a car running on gas is producing emissions right there while driving. That's a fact and you can't even find an argument that it's not, you know, it is happening. Even though they got a lot more efficient, yes, but with all the scandals in all the years from especially German car manufacturers with the wrong software and so on, I would be very, very careful when it comes to how much they really do uh, have in terms of emissions. Um, you can't really prove that, you know, and whatever they tell you, we learned in the past is wrong, so why wouldn't it be wrong now? However, with an e-car, there is no emission, so that's a definite, definite point. But then again, also the production process, if you look at this, it all comes down to the one question you have to answer, and that is, is an EV car a wrong option because it's not there yet? Or is the discussion going into a wrong direction because it assumes things, status quo, that are about to change definitely? Like, it's not even an if or when or maybe, it is definitely going to happen. So the first question I just said is a definite no. 
EVs are great already. They have a good range, they have everything that they need and they are a very good alternative. Not for everyone, but for most people they are a great alternative. And this is very important to notice. Because this will then lead you to the conclusion that when you want to become a lot more cleaner in terms of uh, mobility, I call it, then you have to change to a vehicle that is producing no emissions, full stop. That is an EV or like with, um, you know, uh, the water, um, I, I forgot the hybrid cars or like the um, hyperfuel cars, they basically, this is a different story, we talk about that later in a different video. I don't want to go down this road, but um, this, is, this is definitely a, a conclusion you have to draw from this. You have to switch now to avoid any emissions and the, the reason why I say this by now is 10 years ago I wouldn't have said that, maybe even 5 years ago I wouldn't have said that, but now overall energy production is green enough to move forward and I'm fully aware of the fact that still the biggest issue is that a lot of these factories producing batteries, producing car components, producing whatever for, is relevant for a car are using too much fossil energy to produce these cars and they are producing emissions like crazy. The problem is, if you exclude the battery, which we keep that for a second, okay? We talk about the battery in a couple of seconds. But if you take all the other parts, these are parts that a normal car has as well. So the argument that is always given from people like that, the production is so, um, so dirty and whatever, they are basically irrelevant simply because normal cars do have the same issues. They even do have a lot of technology in them nowadays. Like there is not that big of a difference anymore. The biggest difference is the battery, but everything else is mainly down to the same, simply because it's a car at the end of the day. You have the same technology in there. You've got screens, you've got whatever, you know, you name it. Um, so it's really, really important to look at these things. And honestly, and this will be like a little add-on at the end of the episode, you have to look into some other areas as well. And not only the the way to propel your car forward, there are a couple of other things which are very important um, when it comes to sustainability and mobility in terms of the future proof, um, or future proofing. Now, battery. Battery is a topic which is very important because essentially, this is what many people moan about and they were right in this regard for a long, long time. There are a couple of components in a normal lithium uh, ion battery that are very bad for the environment because the way how they are extracted and the fact that we don't have you know endless materials like that um, is, is hurting the environment just as much as creating emissions. So again, for example, cobalt and all these things. However, this industry is changing so dramatically quick that these batteries already only use a fraction of the materials that they used to use. Uh, and especially Tesla, for example, who are producing all their batteries in California or like in America, um, simply because they have some issues with um, producing elsewhere because of governmental things, um, means that they are investing a lot of money now into chemical kind of reactions to, to make that. And there were recently so many insane breakthroughs that... Um, it is just ridiculous, you know. They will, in the span of the next five to ten years, even batteries, I would put my hand into fire for that, would become nearly 100% sustainable. Because what many people don't know, they will be reused afterwards. So if a car, an EV is done, you know, these batteries are taken out of the car and they are used in the industry as kind of um, batteries for energy storing. And this is the big thing. This is our biggest issue in terms of overall energy management. We don't have the capacity to store renewable energy at this point. Fossil energy 24 seven. There is no denial that was always on, you know? You got energy when you needed it. It doesn't matter. You can burn coal in the middle of the night. You can have an atomic reaction in the middle of the night and gas and stuff, all works. However, you don't always have sun, you don't ever has, always have wind, and water is always not flowing the same way. So most of the big energy um, providers of renewable energy, they are dependent on temporary effects. Um, so we need to store the energy. When it's very sunny and we produce more energy than we need, we have to store it somewhere. And this is our biggest issue, at least in Europe, there is not the infrastructure of storing. So the more cars we have, 
the more cars we can reuse in terms of having these batteries, the better it overall gets because we can store energy even in this used car components and they do this already quite well and they recycle a very very high amount of parts from EVs um, all across the globe and it will become more and more. So my conclusion on this is even though I know that especially in the Hyundai Ioniq 5 the battery is simply not the best and most cleanest yet. But is that a reason to not buy the car? I think it's not because at the end of its lifespan it's a million times at least it feels no but it's it's a lot lot cleaner and a lot better than buying a new internal combustion engine car and also it will lead the future and pay the money for the investment into this future into new battery into new um, renewable sustainable material and so on and so forth buying an internal combustion engine car from used or new is not paying in that direction so that is where I'm coming from. This is the reason. This is it. And I hope you guys found this interesting. I know I went a little bit right and left, but I think it's very important to talk about that, you know. And I want to just give one last hint to something that I was very happy to see. Now, as I do drive a BMW, um, you could guess or could think that I wanted one again. But first of all, they're out of range when it comes to money. Um, they are way too expensive. And secondly, I think BMW did a lot of very, very bad decisions in the last couple of years. However, they just released the BMW iX, which is the X1 fully electric version, but their very first car completely thought as an electric vehicle. It's a decent electric vehicle, it's great, I would never be able to pay that, it's freaking expensive. But one thing they did, and I think this should lead the way for all car manufacturers, this is the car with the highest ever rate of um, renewable materials or recycled materials. So basically their car is I think made out of over 60% recycled materials and so to say also materials that can be recycled again. Something I never thought about you know. They don't use leather anymore this is already quite you know something that I have done for a while now always fake leather and stuff but they really started to have something in there that uses a lot of different materials no plastic only recycled plastic and so on and so forth. I know it has been a trend, but for me personally, it was not more than a marketing trend, um, just to say you have something. But then I also looked in the Hyundai Ioniq 5, and they are also pretty good at that. They have also a very high rate from over 40% of renewable or recycle and uh, elements. But BMW really pushed it to the next level. And I would love to see manufacturers jump in there and just get in, try new things, try to get these cars 100% uh, recycle. Or recyclable or like renewable I don't know how you want to call that anyhow enough talky talk from my side this got way longer than I expected but I hope you guys enjoyed this please let me know in the comments down below what is your stance on e-mobility and where do you think do we go in the next coming years are you a fan of electric vehicles have you ever driven one do you want to drive one uh, do you want to buy one have you bought one are you completely against it, please tell me in the comments down below and also let me know the why. I'm really interested into the why. I want to start a discussion because there is no black and white. There's always something in between and we have to just talk about that. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you for, for sticking with me even though I've been away for so, so long. And um, I promise there's going to be more about electric vehicles, but also as promised about other things, having guests on here, making interviews and talking about a lot of other cool things. Now. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're having a good time. I hope you had a good time listening to this uh, podcast. And I know that won't be too many people, but for those who have been listening, thank you so much. You are amazing and you should have a good day. So enjoy it. I talk to you in the next one. Have a good time and goodbye.